Coming up, I'm going to share with you why working hard won't make you successful. And then why your boss just can't quit you. And then labor hoarding, what is it and how does it affect you? Let's do it. Oh, yes, here we go. Helping you win at work and in life. Specifically, I'm going to help you make more money and experience more meaning, more impact, more income is my goal. And so let's dive into this today. Um, Have I lost my mind? Uh, Or am I being uh, a little bit uh, cute with our title today? You decide, but I'm going to stand by it. Why working hard isn't going to make you successful. Now, we live in the day and age where we've got a lot of influencers on social media and I'm not going to call them out, but you know, it's like, you got to work hard. You got to, you got to out hustle the competition. I don't sleep. I can sleep when I'm dead. I don't know if they talk like that, but it feels like that's the, that's the tone behind it. And it's pretty empty. The reason I chose that voice and that character, if you will, is because that's what it feels like to me. It feels like cotton candy. You ever taken a bite of cotton candy? I'm going to let that one sit for a second once you think about it. No. Nobody bites into cotton candy. You know what would happen? Your teeth would clang together. It would hurt. Nobody needs to bite cotton candy because there's no substance. And I think this kind of, you know, hustle culture and, oh, I'll sleep when I die and all this hustle, hustle, hustle. I out hustle everybody. I work so hard. It's all a bunch of hype and crap for social media designing Eclipse. Because in reality, there's an old phrase. I don't know how old it is. I don't know who authored it. But work smart, not hard. That really is the truth. Tim Ferriss, uh, who I had the pleasure to interview years ago on the Entree Leadership Podcast, wrote a best-selling book, The 4-Hour Work Week, and he overhyped that. I'm not taking shots at Tim, but I'm just telling you, he overhyped it, and he went the other way, and a bunch of people bought into it. What? And so you've got all these wild swings. But the phrase to work smart, not hard, doesn't mean, by the way, that I think that you shouldn't work hard. I do believe in hard work. It's going to take hard work to to do what it is you want to do. But hard work as it's as the solution that I just have to work hard is not a guarantee of success. That is the point I'm making today. And if you're not careful, you'll work hard and you'll work harder and you'll work harder and you'll work harder. You'll lose all sense of boundaries, all sense of self. You will burn out if working hard is the focus. Might I suggest that if you work smart, you won't have to worry about the hard work part. If you work smart the way that I'm going to lay out for you in just moments, then Working hard will be a byproduct. In fact, we have a, uh, we have a, uh, I'm going to do something that I've never done on the show before. And uh, Alex, don't worry, you're going to love this. Uh, but, but I, I, it just occurred to me, I, we didn't plan this. But today's teaching, um, I did an Instagram uh, reel on this. And, and I'm just going to let you hear. You can maybe see it, but I'm just going to play it here. You want to hear some positive sounding garbage? If you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. What? That's horse crap. The fact is, if you do what you love, you'll work harder, better, and longer. There it is. So that's just on my Instagram at Ken Coleman. And I've said that very thing on the show before. And 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 and, and, and by the way, that's I mean that. That's a bunch of crap. Because I work hard, but I don't work hard as the focus. I work on purpose. And because I work on purpose, I put in the hard work. So it is the focus of doing what I was created to do, using my methodology that I teach. Talent plus passion plus mission equals purpose. Here's how it's said in real words. When I use what I do best to do work I love, to produce results that matter to me, I'm wildly successful. And by the way, I'll work hard and hard work comes as a part of that. But, but I'm not just working hard and hustling and trying to prove myself and make my self-identity be about how hard I work. In other words, 
It's the busyness. People are all hung up on how busy they are. They want to tell everybody how busy they are. I don't give a crap how busy you are. I want to know how effective you are. So let me break this down a little bit further. There's a very famous TED Talk by a guy by the name of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, and I take great pleasure in saying his name, Alex, because I practiced it for years so that I could let that roll off your tongue. Because Nathan, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, I couldn't spell his name if my life depended on it, uh, but he's a, uh, I believe he's a Hungarian uh, psychologist. But anyway, he has a very famous TED Talk uh, around the subject of flow. And it's work-related. So what is flow? He calls it a state of flow. And for those of you that have been following me and listening to me and watching me for some time, it's his version of saying what I say as I relate to the sweet spot, right? Where people look at you and they just go, you were born for this. But he actually breaks it down as a psychologist, and he is an expert on this. And so I'm going to give you what he says. I'm going to give you the TED Talk uh, very, very briefly. So what is a state of flow? And I would say to you, it is working smart, not hard. So what does working smart look like? Here we go. According to Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the eight characteristics of flow, working in your flow looks like, feels like this. Complete concentration on the task. Clarity of, that's one, clarity of goals and immediate feedback. That's two. Transformation of time. In other words, things speed up or they slow down. You've heard sportscasters maybe say this if you've ever watched a game. You know, you got a rookie NFL quarterback, and it takes some time for them for the game to slow down. Peyton Manning has famously said in his first season when he hit, broke the record for interceptions uh, for a quarterback, he said the game was just so fast, and after a couple seasons, everything began to slow down. In other words, he got more comfortable. Uh, four, the experience is intrinsically rewarding. This is what I talk about when I talk about mission results that matter deeply to us. Uh, five, it's just the, the the work is easy. It's effortless. Six, there's a balance between challenge and skills. In other words, the challenge is great and it pushes you, but you have the skills to actually do it. So what you're seeing here is there's no frustration. Like it's challenging for me to do a live show every day. I'm challenged by it, but I have the skill set to do it. At least I think I do. If you don't like it, well, you can watch another show. Uh... Seven, actions and awareness are merged, losing self-conscious rumination. This is my favorite part of flow, Alex. And what happens, what he's saying here is all these fancy words, is that action, I'm doing the action, and I'm aware of everything surrounding the action, and they merge. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what I need to do, but I'm able to do what I need to do. In other words, and he says the the the, the losing self-conscious rumination, I mean, I'm not thinking about it. I'm not overanalyzing. I'm just present in the moment. The final number eight is there's a feeling of control over the task. You just feel like you got it. I'm in control. I'm confident. I got this. So I share all this to say, if your focus is hustle and hard work, as opposed to the right work, then you're not going to ever be as successful as you could be and should be. But if you use what you do best talent to do work, you love passion, to produce results that matter to you, mission. Guess what? You're going to work smart and you're going to love it. Coming up next, labor hoarding. What is it and why people aren't going to get laid off? Did you know that just like a product, you have a personal brand? It's the image or impression others form about you based on your interactions. And whether we realize it or not, our personal brand impacts opportunities to grow in our careers. That's why our team created the Personal Brand Survey. It's free and it will give you personal and professional feedback so you can own your strengths and uncover any blind spots holding you back. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash brand. Of the people, by the people, for the people. I am the man of the people. Ken Coleman, this is the Ken Coleman Show. The show is completely dedicated to helping you make more income and more impact. I want you to have more money and experience more meaning. And uh, one of the side effects of all this is that you're going to enjoy Mondays again. So 
Welcome aboard if you're new. If you are a returning viewer or listener, whether that be radio, Sirius XM podcast, or YouTube, thank you so very much. And I, I'd like to remind you, if you're enjoying the show, uh, would you please share it with somebody? Uh, word of mouth is the ultimate. If I was going to be advising a business owner, and I do many times, people want to start a business, hey, win the word of mouth game. That means to take care of one customer, two customer, three customer, four, and they start preaching. They become a evangelist for you, and you win. And I don't ask you all for much, uh, but I want to be more regular in asking you, please share the show. Uh, however you listen, wherever you listen, that would be great. Okay. Um, as a man of the people, I have to keep you folks up to date. And I learned a new term this week. It's called labor hoarding. And you know, there's always new terms coming out all the time. And so this is a term that economists have spun up. And um, it is basically, I think, a sign of good news that maybe we won't see mass layoffs that so many people are scared of when you hear the word recession. So on that note, news out today and yesterday that a large portion of economists are pretty much guaranteeing that we will move into a recession either late in 2022 or in 2023, okay? So that's two straight quarters of the gross domestic product. You can look this up on your own, uh, but there are, there are clear economic data points. And when we have two straight quarters of those data points showing us retraction, then you're in a recession. And let's be clear, the Fed and Jerome Powell, they, they outkicked their coverage. Too much cash uh, was released from the Fed into the economy, and now we're paying the price for it. So now they have they've signaled that they don't have any other moves to make other than drive unemployment up. And they're trying. But what's crazy is it ain't working. So now... Here comes a term that you learned in fifth or sixth grade, and I'm not going to nerd out on it, but go look up stagflation. At some point, you got a quiz or a test on it. Here's what it means. It means inflation is high and the economy is lagging. You never want that. You don't want that. And that's where we're headed, so say the economists. All right. So as a result, companies who laid off so many people and by the way, it was about 22 million. 22 million people were laid off during the pandemic. And companies learned their lesson. They're like, those people didn't come back. There's a novel idea. Hey, we're going to furlough and lay off a bunch of people because we got freaked out. Right? And now we can't get them to come back. So now companies are going, whoa. You'll remember our friend, uh, Julia Pollack, who's the chief economist at ZipRecruiter. And she's been on the show multiple times. This is a quote. This is from an Inc. Magazine article. She's quoted. She says, as the cost of losing people to layoffs and firings has grown, the number of layoffs and firings has fallen. Labor market dynamics have fundamentally changed. Time to hire, the amount of time it takes to list and fill a job. Recruiting costs, hiring outside recruiting firms. You got to pay for that, folks. Uh, and hiring costs have all grown substantially. Hiring costs would be the signing bonuses that we read about, increased in, uh, income in the form of salaries and hourly wages. So here we stand with a current job situation where we still have right about two job openings for every person who is unemployed. So that means it's harder for companies to get talent. So now they go, we may be going into a recession we got to find ways to keep our people. I don't want to let them go because it's already hard enough to find people. I don't want to get in a situation where we can't hire. July 2022 was the 16th straight month in which the layoff rate was below pre-pandemic levels. That has continued. Economist Dr. Julia Coronado of the Macro Policy Perspective said this, It has been such a tough road to staffing up and turnover is still so high Firms are reluctant to freeze hiring and plan to use any slowdown to acquire or hold on to top talent. So it's the exact opposite. So this term labor hoarding has been applied, where companies are going, we're going to keep employees even in tough times or do everything we can to do so, so that we don't have 
all of the challenges of hiring coming out of the recession. So what does it mean? It means that companies are hesitant to lay people off or even fire problem people. Uh-oh. So it has swung the leverage, if you will, from the boss to the employee, from the leader to the worker. They're putting up with problem employees more because of fear. I don't think it's right. I still think you have to act with good leadership principles in times of uncertainty, just as much as you do in times of certainty. Uh, so this means the Federal Reserve is increasing interest rates to fight inflation and, and cool the economy. But here's the problem. It may not trigger the kind of job loss they're hoping for. And that's what I just said. I think we might move into stagflation because, wait a second, inflation is going to keep going up and certain parts of the economy may go down. We might. We might not. But if we go into a full-blown recession, we will be in stagflation. Uh, decades ago, the Fed chair, Paul Volcker, used the same playbook. And this is why I get mad sometimes. As I tell you folks, this is moronic. I don't want to go into the history lesson because I nerd out. I don't want to do that to you fine folks. But Paul Volcker did this. Joe will remember. I remember. They drove unemployment to over 10% to fight inflation bunch of adults and they dust off this bad playbook that's what they're trying to do well what happens if companies don't lay off people are they going to keep raising interest rates what's going to happen well nobody really knows uh, but we are seeing signals that companies are trying to hang on to more people than they might need so what's going to happen profit margins will shrink all right Companies are going to go, well, normally in a season of recession, we would cut costs. We're going to retain these costs because we think it's going to shake out in the end. So in other words, companies are battening down the hatches. It's an old phrase, right? And what does that mean? That means when the storm is coming, you get in the storm shelter, right? Or you you put the storm shutters that nobody actually ever uses. Back in the old day, the reason to have shutters is because they would shut those pieces of wood up against the glass to avoid the glass shattering. It was a way of hunkering down to use another old phrase. Boy, I'm bringing out all the old phrases today. Batten down the hatches. Hunker down. That means prepare for a storm. And they're just going to try to ride out the storm. Uh, but here are some of the signs to see that we think it's happening. Low level of layoffs, high level of job openings. We're seeing that right now. That's a sign of what they're calling labor hoarding. Another sign. Uh, hourly workers aren't getting the overtime. They aren't getting the hours that maybe they used to get or they would expect to get because companies have more people so they can pass the hours around. Um, and, of course, workers aren't as abundant and expendable as they once were. Here's what happened. People ask me all the time, Ken, why do we have the big gap? To where we sit today to where there's roughly two jobs available for every worker that's unemployed and wants to be employed what you have to look at is the number of boomers that retired in the midst of the pandemic they're basically like screw this i'm out they laid me off they furloughed me i'm done i can retire maybe a little tighter than i wanted it to be but i'm going to go ahead and retire and they haven't returned that's your biggest reason for the gap is a lot of boomers said i'm done um, and then new jobs were created so all that together puts us where we stand so here's the deal I don't know that we're going to see mass layoffs and that's good news but keep saving, keep working hard you're going to make it through this storm I promise, this is the Ken Coleman Show So you just landed the new job. Congratulations. You've made it past the interviews and now it's time to onboard with excellence. That's why I created How to Stand Out at Your New Job. This free checklist will help you succeed from day one and may even help you get promoted. These practical steps set you up to add value, help your team win, exceed your leader's expectations, and ultimately set you up for a successful transition. To get started, just go to kencoleman.com slash new.
Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Thrilled to have you with us. So LinkedIn's got some very interesting information out that I think you need to know. The hard skills and soft skills that uh, are very, very valuable to hiring managers. And so this plays into two specific application areas for this. One, on your resume, making sure that you've got these key phrases, key words, and two, in the interview process, to sprinkle these in to the interview conversations. Um, hard skills and soft skills are how we refer to skills, right? So hard skills are more technical in nature and specialized. And then you can think of soft skills as interpersonal skills, people skills, okay? So a new LinkedIn learning report found that the top skills to future-proof your career, and that's fancy language again. Why do we have to say things like that? Why can't we just say, this helps you stand out? Well, that's what future-proof is, right? So no matter what the world of work is doing, what the trends are, this makes you an attractive candidate or a very valuable employee so that, hey, they don't want to let you go, okay? So here's what we see from the recent study from LinkedIn, leadership skills, communication skills, problem-solving skills, and those would be more in the soft skill area. And then some of the technical skills that stand out were customer service, sales, and accounting. Okay. Um, but again, when you hear lists like this, what's more important is that you go, okay, if I look at my industry and then I look at the type of work that I'm doing and want to do in my industry, outside of these general categories that Ken is giving me, the question you've got to ask yourself is, what are some skills that I see every day that I don't have and I am valued in my company, but if I were to add this, I become more valuable. So one example could be maybe some certain softwares and technical skills that you don't have. You're crushing it in all these skills. You go, well, if I were to go get certified uh, or be able to understand this software or this, this, and this, because I actually lead people who are proficient in it. But if I became proficient in it, how much more valuable would that make me? I mean, I think that's what I'm getting at here. You, you may not use these skills much at all in the current moment, but you might have to use them in the future. And if you had them in your tool belt, you know, it's kind of like somebody walking on, hey, uh, Coleman, you got uh, some needle nose pliers? It sure would be great to be able to go, yes, sir, I do, and reach in and grab the needle nose pliers and hand them. This is the idea. What would a full tool belt look like for you in your industry, in your job? Meaning you're not spending much time at all using the needle nose pliers, but boy, it sure is nice to have that full toolbox. I mean, that's my situation at home. I don't ever use hardly any tools because it's dangerous to me in my house. But if I have somebody come over, like my father-in-law who helps out, he goes, hey, uh, do you have one of these in the garage? It behooves me, uh, benefits me to be able to say, hey, yeah, I've got that tool. And so this is what I want you thinking about. Um, specifically in this article, um, they, they feature, this is a CNBC article, they feature opinions from three different LinkedIn creators, people that are putting content on LinkedIn. Um, Audrey P. is a, is a um, entrepreneur, founder of technology accessibility nonprofit WeTech, founded in the Philippines and now has over 400 employees, 26 chapters across 10 countries. And P believes that hard skills like programming and computer literacy, in addition to public speaking and networking, are crucial drivers. Okay, so I'll use the language here. So programming, very, very specific uh, hard skill. Computer literacy, I touched on that just moments ago, talking about, you know, softwares, maybe systems that you may lead people who use these systems every day, but you aren't technically very proficient. It would be smart to be proficient. And then, of course, they mentioned public speaking, which is the communication skill and networking, which I would rephrase as connecting the ability to just connect with people. 
it's not it's not the discipline of doing it, but it's the ability, you know. So asking questions, finding commonality is the best way to connect. If you go, Ken, I don't know if I'm a good connector. I would say this. Are you good at finding commonality with a complete stranger? If you sit in the doctor's office or at a school function for your kids, you meet somebody for the first time, in five minutes, can you find com commonality? Let me just tell you this. If you can find commonality quickly, I would say that you are very good at connecting. That's all it is. Uh, Dylan Gambardella. CEO of Next Gen HQ, a business hub dedicated to helping young entrepreneurs reach their goals, said the skills that matter would be confidence, communication, grit, wellness, and a growth mindset. And if I could reword these, because this is interesting to me. And I'm not trying to pick this stuff apart. But confidence is not a skill. Uh, it's just not. Confidence is an attitude. And we get confidence, the attitude of confidence, by being somebody who's very, very clear. I know who I am and what I do well and what I want to do. And so then you're very confident. In other words, you've heard the phrase comfortable in your own skin. That's an attitude, not a skill. So just want to correct that. Communication, grit, wellness, mindset. A growth mindset, uh, Maybe call that a soft skill. Grit, again, grit's not a skill. Grit is a quality. I have the grit from clear conviction and passion. So there you go. I didn't mean to set out to correct all these things, but these people are being quoted. Now, grit's not a skill. It's a quality. Uh, it's a character trait that's developed. Uh, and then finally, Eric Sim, an author, lecturer, and financial investor, um, advises professionals to learn skills that may not be directly related to their roles. So I just said that. So we can move on from that. Uh, but that is the idea of the tool belt analogy for those of you that are keeping score at home. Okay, next, I wanted to cover this very quickly because we do have leaders that listen and watch this show. And this is an interesting article from Forbes. Cover this very, very quickly. Uh, the headline is CEO's role is changing. The CEO's role is changing. Um, and I think everybody understands what the, the traditional CEO role is. Vision casting, uh, goal setting for the company at large, sensitive, caring for the needs of employees, customers, and vendors, right? And, or suppliers. Well, obviously things have changed. And, um, uh, this is very interesting. Egon Zender is a recruitment firm. And they did a study of nearly 1,000 global CEOs, and nearly 80% of the CEOs said they needed to transform themselves as well as their organizations, and this is amazing, to be more adaptive and self-aware. I'm so excited. Like, this is huge right here because a leader who is self-aware can be more adaptive. And, and the ability to adapt, I also think this is, and this is called a soft skill, but adaptability is something that is a soft skill that can be grown. And it starts with awareness all the time of what's most important, what needs to change. And so thus, thus we must adapt. And so self-awareness and adaptability makes for a tremendously, tremendously pliable leader who can grow. Um, and so the reason that this is, this is happening is because CEOs are realizing in the war for talent, and it's a war, and the shifting sands of the way we do work, how we do work, still uh, you know, adapting to the customer's life changing. It's really a more about influence and relationships. And uh, so this is huge. The new CEO, the one who will win, will be the CEO who is aware and adaptable because that's the new game. True leadership. It's about people and influence. You were created to fill a unique role through your work, but it can feel overwhelming to figure out what that is. That's why I created the Get Clear Career Assessment. 
In just 15 minutes, you'll get customized results that clarify what you do best, the work you love to do, and the results that motivate you. All this helps you discover what you were born to do. And you'll get a list of professional possibilities to help you in your job search. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash assessment. I had to do it. Uh, a little special treat for our YouTube audience. I may have thrown my neck out, Alex, so I'm going to have to get a heating pad, Nathan. Maybe some sports cream. I don't know. Probably shouldn't do that. Uh, but uh, that was fun energy there. All right, it's uh, time for our coaching segment of the show. Andrew joins us in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Andrew, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken, how you doing? I am living the dream, but I got a stiff neck all of a sudden. That uh, you got great, you that, got great music there for sure. Yeah. I, uh, Joe does it, man. Joe Hankin on the bumps, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. How can I help That's today? Uh, well, I'd like to just quickly read the two little sentences I got so I get it straight. Okay. Um, so, uh, I gave my two weeks notice last week. A few days later, a particular situation arose where my boss asked me to directly lie to a coworker Whoa. to protect, to protect themselves. I said, I would not lie to the coworker and I did not. Good for you. Said coworker has also put their notice in, but has given a few months notice. So they will be there after I leave to my new job. I've known this coworker for 15 years, but even if I hadn't, should I let them know of the behavior that was, that happened? What is behind this question? What's fueling this? Do you feel like even though they're leaving and on their way out that in that time they have left, they need to be aware of this and you're doing this to protect them in some way? Or what's behind you asking this question? Should I tell them? that my boss wanted me to lie to them. What's behind it? What do you feel you're doing? If you do tell them. Um, I feel like if I do tell them, um, I don't know their reaction, but I feel like I'm struggling with it because the worst reaction would be that they quit on the spot and leave everyone else kind of high and dry. Okay. That's what I was um, getting at. I, yeah. I, I didn't word it very well. I was trying to think my way through <laughs> it because ultimately the answer to this question, what should you do is your decision. But I mm -hmm. wanted to know your motivation for why you wouldn't do it. Cause it, on, on the surface it's like, well, sure they're leaving anyway. Mm -hmm. I, you, yeah. That's, you know, that's the weird, that's the weird part of the situation is we're both on our way out. Um, yeah, but let me ask and, you this. Uh, yeah. What's interesting about the way you worded that is, well, if I mm -hmm. tell them they may live on the spot and that's going to leave people in the lurch. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. is two months difference really that different? You know, to the difference between leaving now versus two months from now. I mean, really? Like you're leaving. Mm -hmm. Right. You're leaving for the right reasons. People are going to be left behind no matter what. Yeah. It's not your problem. So right. the question is, is do you feel like it serves them well? And, and so if you're worried about them leaving sooner rather than later and that hurting the people left behind, I got to tell you, I don't think that's a viable reason to not mm. tell them. I got you. Now, does it serve any good at all by telling them? That's That's where I just feel like it's uh, me getting it off my conscience more so than aiding and making the place better. Yeah, but I mean, I think you're feeling like you should do it. I think, I think if I remove, which I tried to, the guilty conscience of hurting your other coworkers if this person leaves if i remove that i feel like you really want to tell this person you know this this guy or gal asked me to lie to you i wouldn't mm -hmm. do it and i just want yeah, you to know yeah you were just talking about the leadership stuff and um it's definitely why i'm leaving 
uh, cause there's a lot of lack of that <laughs> and direction, but, uh, you know, it was just kind of a sobering moment of, okay, it, it happened a few days after I put my notice in. So, yeah. I mean, if you feel not, better yeah. by getting it off your chest, um, this person's leaving anyway, so you're not influencing their decision mm -hmm. to work there or not. They've already decided. So if it makes you feel right. better, get it off your chest. Gotcha. Just, hey, FYI, you know, but yeah, I don't know that it accomplishes that, a whole bunch either, but if it makes you feel <laughs> right, better, right. if it makes you feel better uh, and you want them to know it, I'd let them know. And I think that's where you got to go here. I don't think there's any right or wrong here. And uh, whether they leave tomorrow or two months from now, that's really not up to you. And there's going to be people left behind when we leave, folks. But it's not about what's behind us. It's what's in front of us that we should be focused on. Did you know that recruiters take an average of six seconds to scan a resume? And that's if they ever see it in the first place. In fact, 75% of resumes are rejected before reaching a hiring manager. Listen, folks, if you want to get hired, you've got to make your resume worth noticing. That's why we created How to Write the Perfect Resume. This free guide will walk you through the five steps to stand out in the hiring process to get you your dream job. If you want to get started, go to kencoleman.com slash resume. Helping you get unstuck, get on purpose. Helping you climb the ladder faster. Helping you enjoy the Monday through Friday. This is the Ken Coleman Show. I'm Ken. Ivan S., one of our YouTube watchers, went in the old chat room and said, uh, he was talking to another viewer and said, hey, the assessment, the Get Clear assessment, hit the nail on the head for me. It was a total reaffirmation of my strengths and where to move forward. Thanks for the kind words, Ivan. We have that Get Clear assessment, the signature tool that allows you to get clear, quick answers to what I've been teaching for over five years on the show. Talent plus passion plus mission equals purpose. How do I know what I was created to do? Where do I get the ideas from? We got to know you first. The Get Clear Assessment on sale for only $10 this month in October. It's a $30 product. We've sold it to tens and tens of thousands of people. And it's a wonderful gift to somebody who just needs that jolt of confidence, a nudge forward, if you will. It's a wonderful tool. It's going to help you or the person who takes it get real specific clarity on what they do best. That's the talent piece. What work fires them up. That's the passion piece. And what results motivate them. That's the mission piece. All those together, when those threads come together, when I use what I do best to do what I love, to produce results that matter to me, I am on purpose. I am on fire. People notice that I was born for this. That's the tool. Gives you a very detailed report, uh, and you're going to love it. 20-minute assessment. It's called the Get Clear Assessment. It's available right now through the month of October for $10. KenColeman.com. KenColeman.com. Also, uh, in our desire to disrupt the education world, Ramsey Career Academy and Ramsey Ed and Ken Coleman all partnering together. I just talked about myself in the third person. That was weird. Don't want to do that anymore. Uh, but we're partnering to do the digital marketing course as uh, one of our newest cohorts. Digital Marketing 101, a great career path with lots of opportunities to move up and around with that skill set. Andy High, our Ramsey Solutions Senior Digital Marketing Officer, and I teach you the ins and outs, the hard skills of digital marketing, and the soft skills needed to win. It's a wonderful course, very affordable, very effective in the amount of time it takes. RamseySolutions.com slash marketing course. RamseySolutions.com slash marketing course. Go check it out. All right. Margaret is up next in San Antonio, Texas. Margaret, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, how are you today, Ken? I'm living the dream, Margaret. What are you doing? Great to hear. Great to hear. I've got a couple of questions for you here. Um, I actually did take your uh, career assessment, and it actually did a great job, I believe, of uh, narrowing down my path. Um, I've actually been a stay-at-home homeschooling mom for the last uh, 18 years. Wow. So I really don't have um, a lot of uh, in-person, I guess, experience. Um, Doing so what? So I don't really feel 
qualified to do um, what? Anything. So I have a few ideas. I knew it. Of things that I would like to do. Give me the favorite idea, Margaret. Let's start there. Okay. All right. So I would like to help connect high school students in particular to companies um, and businesses for like for shadowing. And I know you talk about this a lot, but um, basically be the in-between for families helping to find um, places for their, their kids to go to shadow. Um, that way yeah, they can. Um, I get it. What's your, I'm, sorry, I want, I'm a little bit nervous. No, so you're, doing great. Help, uh, you're doing great. You're doing great help kids discover their passions yeah. before going to college and spending a lot of money yeah. just to figure out, well, this isn't what I want to do. Sounds like you want to um, join the Ken Coleman army. <laughs> I love indeed. it. All right. Now um, what's your second idea? I'm going to come back to these quickly, but I want to go through your top two or three ideas and then I'm going to show okay. you based on your assessment results. Uh, Cause I think, you know what you want to do a general idea. You're just not quite sure which direction to go or where to start. That's what I believe is going on. So yeah, that's correct. What's your second idea? Um, my second thing is a community center of sorts, kind of like a space, uh, a safe place for teens to go um, that are struggling. Hmm. Um, somewhere okay. where they can get connection, safety, some therapy, um, coping that. skills, life skills. Love that. Um, but all, right. all of this at no cost. I get you. Um, okay. What's the third idea? Is there a, a twist? Th is there a third? <laughs> yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Is there a third idea? Um, I'm kind of thrown around the idea of being a financial coach. I'm coach. I'm going through all the baby steps right now. And, okay. All right. Um, I'm just loving all of that. But the um, first two were, are definitely more. Okay. Great. Now I've got all. The, I've got all that. Here's what I want you to. Do. I want you to slowly read your purpose statement that you got from the uh, report on talent, passion, and mission in the assessment. I want to. I want you to slowly read it so I can jot it down. Okay. I was created to use my talents of compassion, okay. organization, execution. Hold on. Organization and execution. Okay. Give me the three mm -hmm. passions. Uh, protection, caregiving, and advocating. Okay. All right. And the top missional result? Uh, service. Yeah. So when I heard the three different ideas, right? So mm -hmm. connecting parents and their teens to uh, professionals in the community for shadowing and, you know, some clarity and confirmation there. Then I heard the uh, community center, a safe place for teens to get a variety of, of resources that will help them. Um, and then I heard financial coaching. What is absolutely woven between the three different ideas um is uh, helping it, people yes <laughs> compassion and serving compassion is one of your talents and then service was your top motivator this is the results that wake you up in the middle of the night you get fired up if you start thinking about different ways to serve people you can't turn your brain off it's so, very true i have lost nights of sleep over it <laughs> I, I get it that's so great so so the good news is all three ideas are good ideas and they absolutely could make sense for you. But what I thought was the driving theme here in two of the ideas were teenagers, adolescents, and you want to meet them where they are to help them get where they should be. That was what I heard loud and clear. And that's coming from your story in some way in some fashion. Am I right? You don't have to tell me. We don't have the time to uncover it, but that's coming mm -hmm. from a deep area of maybe some pain or passion. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So we have to acknowledge that and say that we have to not just acknowledge, but act on that. Now, I think what's overwhelming for you is because you're a self-starter and you've got some very clear and specific ways you want to meet those adolescents where they are and I think you're thinking of it only in the context of you doing it yourself. And I think that's paralyzing you as opposed to you've been a stay at home mom, homeschool mom for a long time. And now we need to start to transition into this and to build a bridge to it. And it may not be, may not be the best way to do this by starting it on your own, but going and work for somebody who's already doing this. 
So the way we contextualize this is in San Antonio proper, right? The surrounding areas, think of San Antonio on an old school map. We draw a circle mm -hmm. and we go in this big giant area, who is serving adolescents? Okay, we start with that. So we can go find that on Google right now. And then we say, then we look at that list and go, how are those organizations serving adolescents? So that's everything from high schools to charities to uh, community colleges to government agencies that, you know, whatever. And so we, we look at who's serving. Then we look at how are they serving. And then we go, okay, where does my heart tend to connect with these areas? You know, where am my heart going? Ding, 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 ding. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that, now we begin to see possibilities for you to work and serve teens. Now you may start there, get involved, get some experience, develop some skill set, and start to see, well, I'd do it this way, or I would do it this way on my own. And maybe one day you start a nonprofit or a ministry. But right now, my advice is simply what I just gave you. It's a Google exercise. And then once we find out who is serving, how serving, what jobs do they have available that I'm qualified for or could get qualified for pretty quickly. And I'm gonna dive in, full immersion, to begin to open your heart up to all the great possibilities. You're amazing, Margaret. You're gonna help a lot of teens. Go do it. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.